The year was 1860. The nation was coming apart, and yet its political parties made plans to come together, to gather in convention despite deep-seated and festering sectional issues. Each denominate a candidate and approve platforms that, as it turned out, united regions, but not a nation. That meant dark consequences, ensuring this country would reap a cataclysmic whirlwind. With today's polarization as an historical backdrop, this is the story of the most divisive presidential election in the history of this nation, the election of 1860. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there, to show that history is indeed a story. It was a Wednesday, the 18th of April, 1860, and to Charleston, South Carolina, they began to arrive. Men who hoped to nominate the next president of the United States. Their journey had been difficult. Those that traveled by rail arrived exhausted. The delegates from Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania arrived by boat and quickly realized they were in a place that did not welcome northern men and their ideas. The Democrats there who supported five foot four inch Stephen A. Douglas, the little giant, hoped to hammer out an inoffensive platform, then corner two thirds of the convention vote, which would mean two hundred and two of the three hundred and three there. Confident they were organized and believed they could control the creation process for the platform. And they were willing to dangle federal appointments to secure those who could be persuaded. But their man, as of late, had issues. His health was poor, and he was financially embarrassed. Politically, he still clung to the belief that popular sovereignty and non-intervention could save a threatened union. His managers were so organized and aggressive, they unintentionally pushed deep South delegates to extreme measures. There were other anti-Douglas men, those supportive of sitting Democratic President James Buchanan, who never forgave Douglas's break with the president two years earlier over the Kansas Territorial Constitution crisis. The Southern extremists included William Lowndes Yancey and Leroy P. Walker, both of Alabama, and William Barksdale of Mississippi. These men, along with the pro-Buchanan administration delegates, hoped to draft a platform Douglas would never support. They hoped the resulting chaos would break up the convention, the party, and pave the way for not only secession, but an independent Southern Republic. Given their mission, a surprising fact. Many common folk of several Gulf states were unionists and firmly believed their state elections had been rigged so that radical delegates would be sent to Charleston. Regardless, on Monday, April the 23rd, after an 11 a.m. shower, the delegates moved into South Carolina Institute Hall on Meeting Street. From the start, the structure was too small for the 3,000 who gathered. The first order of business, the important task of electing a chair. Although he was an anti-Douglas man and advocate for Mississippi's Jefferson Davis, the man chosen was a delegate at large from Massachusetts, Caleb Cushing. All believed that, despite his pro-Davis stance, he was a fair man. Immediately thereafter, there was an angry discussion and decision that allowed votes to be cast individually unless a delegation was bound by state instruction. This concerned delegates from the Deep South, for it meant 30 to 40 Douglas men were now freed up. The next discussion Cushing chaired related to the platform. 
It was decided to create the party's platform before balloting for a candidate. As it turned out, that decision meant disaster for the Democratic Convention, for the Little Giants delegation had pledged not to accept a platform that included a slave protection plank in the territories. Alabama and other states from the Deep South had pledged to withdraw if not. In short, long before a candidate was chosen, party unity was doomed. On the third day, the 25th, the decision was made to seat one of two groups of delegates from Illinois and New York. That decision helped Douglas, for he would gather more votes. On the fourth day, with proceedings handcuffed by the decision that no balloting for candidates would begin until a platform had been agreed upon, the day was spent waiting for the platform committee to complete its task. On Friday, the 27th, city's mild weather had turned to cold rain, blustering winds. But the bad weather gave the platform committee an additional morning to complete its work. Around 12.30, the frazzled committee entered the convention hall with copies of majority and minority reports. The majority report had signatures from 15 slave states plus Oregon and California. The majority report was a majority by a razor-thin one vote, 17 states to 16. The report's focus? Congress had no power to abolish slavery in the territories. Territorial legislatures had no power to abolish slavery or impair the right of property in slaves. The Minority Report reaffirmed the Democratic Party's position in 1856, which supported popular sovereignty. As might be expected, heated debate began and consumed the rest of the day. Eventually, two speakers proved to be the opposing lightning rods of principle. The very crises of the gathering had arrived, and it came in the human forms of Alabama's William Lowndes Yancey for the majority and for the minority, George E. Pugh of Ohio. In his speech, Yancey thundered, Ours is the property invaded. Ours are the institutions which are at stake. Ours is the peace that is to be destroyed. Ours is the honor at stake, the honor of children, the honor of families, the lives, perhaps of all, all of which rest upon what your course ultimately may make, a great heaving volcano of passion and crimes if you are unable to consummate your design. Bear with us. Then, if we stand sternly upon what is yet that dormant volcano and say we yield no position, no position here until we are convinced we are wrong. Later, at 7 p.m., and before a packed hall, Pew replied. His impassioned appeal hammered home with this dramatic statement. Must the Democratic Party be dragged at the chariot wheel of 300,000 slave masters? Gentlemen of the South, you mistake us. You mistake us. We will not do it. An uproar ensued, and it poured out into the Charleston night. The next morning, Saturday, the 28th, more rain and chill, which had to reflect the mood inside Institute Hall. When the opening gavel fell that day, there was more wrangling over the platform, more speeches, and more stormy rhetoric. It lasted all day, carried over into Sunday, after a Saturday night filled with scheming in smoky parlors, back rooms, and hotel bars. On the seventh day of the Democratic Convention, the point of no return. At 10 a.m., the platform was taken up for a vote. With great anxiety, delegates and packed galleries waited and watched. The tally? By a vote 165 to 138, the minority report carried. The 165 free state votes that embraced popular sovereignty was 154 to 30. From those representing the slave states, 11-4 to 108 against. As soon as the vote was announced, Alabama's Walker got the attention of Chairman Cushing and wished to make an announcement. As he moved to the front of the convention hall, a great hush fell. 
with dramatic pause. He gathered in all those in attendance and then announced that the Alabama Convention in Montgomery had directed its delegates to withdraw if they were unable to obtain a slave code resolution, and since their demand had been denied, Alabama would follow its instructions. The Alabamians rose as one and marched out of the hall. Then the Mississippians announced they, too, would retire. Then they were joined by the delegates from Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. Part of the Arkansas delegation joined the walkout. The Texans then en masse left. After consultation, so did Georgia. That night, as the Democratic Party tore itself asunder, Charleston still strangely rang with celebration. Joy for many who believed that soon thereafter, secession would follow and creation of a Southern Confederacy. The next day, the 1st of May, Those that remain dutifully gathered. Their mood, one of dejection. Even more so when they returned to find that perhaps during the night, southern ladies had placed bouquets in the empty seats of those that had walked out the day before. Given the storm to come, those bouquets symbolic of the flowers many would bring to adorn thousands of southern graves. Most of the convention were now quite aware that a Democrat would not win the presidency. For that matter, it would be difficult to even nominate a candidate by the required two-thirds of all elected delegates. The Northwestern Democrats, Douglas men, thought of that and wanted to amend the convention rule to two-thirds of those present, but Chairman Cushman would not allow it. With that, one participant remarked the decision sounded like clods falling on Douglas's coffin. Still, six men were formally nominated. Douglas, James Guthrie of Kentucky, R.M.T. Hunter of Virginia, Daniel S. Dickinson of New York, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, and North Carolina native Joseph Lane of Oregon. Needing 202 votes, on the first ballot, Douglas led with 145 and one-half. The next nearest was Guthrie with 42. Twelve more unsuccessful ballots followed that first day of May, and thereafter, 45 more, a total of 57, and all unsuccessful. Stephen A. Douglas never received more than 152 and one-half votes. Hopelessly deadlocked, the decision was made to adjourn and gather six weeks later in Baltimore. The split party meant the Democrats of the Deep South, who had declared they would never tolerate a Republican president, just made certain one would be elected. Of course, there were many who hoped just that. Forced the issue. Those extremists came to Charleston, a minority in terms of the number of delegates gathered and quite possibly in terms of the citizens they represented. Yet, they wanted to push their will upon the majority. They came to Charleston to voice their hatred of Republican restriction of slavery by Congress and Douglas's message of possible restriction by popular sovereignty. Simply put, they succeeded. Two weeks later, their rivals, the Republicans, gathered in Chicago. With the news from Charleston, delegates arrived glowing with confidence. Running in only its second presidential election, the party's frontrunner for nomination was New York's William Henry Seward. He had solid governmental experience and was a longtime disciple of the free soil cause. Yet the lower north and border state delegates feared he was devious and too radical. One powerful editor, Horace Greeley, agreed. From Missouri came a possible nominee, Edward Bates. Greeley felt Bates the only man who could carry the lower north and border states. Bates was relatively soft on slavery. He was safe, tactful, and a strong unionist. Several believed he might capture some southern votes in western Virginia, western North Carolina, or eastern Tennessee. 
Yet he was little known in the East, and some remembered he once used the issue of slavery as a sensationalized whip to keep him in office. Also, his support of the anti-foreign know-nothing party in 1856 alienated German-Americans and Northeasterners who wanted a strong anti-slavery man. In short, the two, Seward and Bates, were vulnerable. Seward looked risky in conservative northern states, and Bates in those where views were more radical. It seemed the more well-known a candidate was, the more baggage he carried. And so, others were suggested, like Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania, who had the support of the New York Herald, strong-stomached Pennsylvanians, and tariff protectionist everywhere. However, many thought him a crass businessman, a turncoat, and a Pennsylvania machine politician. Most Ohioans stood either behind smooth Salmon Chase or coarse Benjamin Wade. Nationally, former Whigs did not like the cold, calculating, and selfish Chase, who was once a Democrat. Wade, an egomaniac, possessed genuine ability but was far too caustic for the statesmanship required of a chief executive. Ah, and yes, there was another. An Illinois favorite son who saw opportunity in Chicago, Abraham Lincoln. Our popular image of him is the self-made man coming into his own at the Chicago Convention. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Few remember he had been nominated in 1856 for the party's vice presidential slot. Since, Lincoln and his handlers targeted Chicago, and he labored for the opportunity. Back in 59, he paid his dues when he traveled some 4,000 miles, delivering 23 speeches for Republican candidates. He wrote numerous letters, and in response, Lincoln clubs were established in January of 1860. His friends, prepping for Chicago, asked the ambitious Lincoln if he would be available for the vice presidency. His answer? A firm no. And why should he be? For as early as February the 16th, the Chicago Tribune editorially endorsed him. Paper reasoned he would be an excellent middle ground candidate between frontrunner Seward and Bates. And so, Lincoln stayed busy. He seized chances to create a buzz for himself in the East. His Cooper Union address in New York City gathered attention. Then, ostensibly to visit his son Robert, who was attending Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, he made speeches in New Haven, Hartford, Providence, and Concord. During each address, Lincoln reinforced that slavery should first be restricted and left alone where it already existed, in his mind, one small step at a time. As much as the Cooper Union Address was an electric moment for Lincoln, another, just as dramatic, came at the Illinois Republican State Convention, May the 8th, 1860. Richard J. Oglesby, a Mexican War veteran and 49er, wanted the convention to have a touch of campaigning, like the days of Old Hickory and Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. He chatted up John Hanks, who had worked with Lincoln when the two cleared land. In their conversation, rail splitting came up. Hanks took him to an old fence some 12 miles east of Decatur, Illinois, where they plucked up two rails that Hanks identified as those he and Lincoln had split. With them, Oglesby began to plan his moment. It came during the aforementioned Republican State Convention when some 3,000 men and 600 delegates gathered. At an appropriate moment, he had delegates hoist Lincoln above their heads and aloft he was hand-passed all the way to the speaker's platform where he took a seat. And at that precise moment, entering from the back of the hall, bearded old John Hanks and another pioneer moved down the center aisle. In their hands, they carried the two weather-beaten rails that had been found, bedecked with a flag and a banner that read, Abraham Lincoln the rail candidate for president in 1860, 
Two rails from a lot of 3,000 made in 1830 by John Hanks and Abe Lincoln, whose father was the first pioneer of Macon County. The place exploded. The uproar lasted some 15 minutes. Ogilvy's move was right out of the campaigning days of Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison. On the wave of that emotion, the Illinois State Republican Convention instructed its delegates to the National Convention to vote as a unit for their rail splitter. And that Republican National Convention was to meet in the so-called wigwam at the corner of Market and Lake Streets. On the avenues in and around the temporary structure, there were bands and constant parades. Everywhere, managers wooed, intimidated, bargained, maneuvered, tried to outmaneuver, bluffed and swapped favors and votes. And it wasn't only free states that sent delegates. For the slaveholding border states of Kentucky, Maryland, and Virginia were there. Even a bogus six who claimed to be from Texas but not one delegate from North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, or Florida. At noon on Wednesday, the 16th of May, the Republican National Convention convened and did so with great enthusiasm. The energy unbelievable, 1,000 delegates, 10,000 spectators. The next day, the platform was adopted, and unlike the Democrats, it was done with expediency. Free homesteads, tariff revision, internal improvements, a Pacific Railroad, daily overland mail, the immediate entry of Kansas as a free state, and no extension of slavery. On Friday, nominations were to be made, and Seward expected victory. The gavel opened the session at 10 in the morning. The wigwam packed since 9 that morning. 233 votes were needed to secure nomination. And aware of careful staging, Lincoln's manager, David Davis, wanted to top Seward's gallery and so printed up 1,000 counterfeit tickets and distributed them to Lincoln supporters. Despite his efforts the night before, Lincoln warned Davis and his floor managers, make no contracts that will bind me. However, on the convention floor, Davis told his people, Lincoln ain't here and don't know what we have to meet. Reportedly, the biggest promises went to key figures from swing states like Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. It was rumored Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania and Caleb Smith of Indiana were promised cabinet positions. When time for nominations came round, Seward was nominated first, Lincoln second. William L. Dayton of New Jersey, third. Then Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania, John McLean of Ohio, and fellow Buckeye Salomon Chase. At high noon, the balloting began. First ballots included several favorite sons, so most expected a second or third ballot before a nomination was secured. Sure enough, no one got the required 233 after the first ballot. Top two. Seward with 173 and a half, then Lincoln with 102. The drama began with the second ballot. Most of Cameron's delegates switched to Lincoln. Vermont's favorite son, Jacob Collimer, released his 10 votes to Lincoln. Six came from the Chase and McLean camps. And in that second vote, Seward's people had to have felt sick as they sensed their man's momentum had stalled, for his numbers had increased only 11 votes. While he now had 184 and a half, Lincoln's tally had grown to 181. The third ballot began immediately. But only four roll call states in, Massachusetts changed four of its votes from Seward to Lincoln. Then the avalanche began. 
Rhode Island gave Lincoln two new votes. New Jersey gave him eight. Pennsylvania added four. Maryland gave nine. As the third ballot neared completion, Lincoln had 231 and a half votes. One and a half short of nomination. Seward, 180. Then, Ohio's chairman jumped to his feet and announced that four had changed their ballot to Lincoln. Then came pandemonium. None of the 40,000 in or out ever forgot the scene. As one put it, Imagine all the hogs ever slaughtered in Cincinnati, giving their death squeals together. A score of big steam whistles going. A herd of buffaloes or lions could not have made a more tremendous roaring. The Republicans had their man. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for listening to Threads from the National Tapestry. You know, each of these episodes is the result of hours and hours of research and preparation. And it means a great deal to me and our production team to see the likes, the comments, and views. I mean, let me make clear that everything we do here will always, always be accessible to any who are curious to learn about the American Civil War. But we would like to ask you to consider to become a member. Uh, a Threads loyalist, if you will. For less than $5 each month, your support will help us to continue sharing our passion for that tumultuous yet important period of history. Joining is quite easy to do. At the top of each show description, you'll find uh, lo- a link, if you will, to join whether you're watching liking, commenting, or becoming a Threads loyalist. If you click on that link, your support for Threads from the National Tapestry will mean a great deal to me, to our team. And there's no question, any contribution, your support certainly makes a difference. And it's a wonderful acknowledgement for what we try to do. Thank you. And yet, staged between the Democratic and Republican conventions, and with a platform that hoped to gather those in the middle, the Constitutional Union Party held their convention back on May the 9th. They gathered in Baltimore. Most came from the slaveholding border states. The majority, old-time Whigs. So up in years, they were such that other parties called the Constitutional Unionist the Old Gentleman's Party. Those they gathered believed that just as Douglas had split the Democrats, so front-running Seward would divide the Republicans when they gathered. The southern wing of the Constitutional Unionists wanted to nominate Sam Houston. Northerners wanted a veteran Whig. It didn't take long. On the second ballot, 64-year-old John Bell of Tennessee and for vice president, Edward Everett of Massachusetts, who was 67, were nominated. The two, intellectually solid, but they inspired few. Bell, a large slaveholder who was a nationalist, was conservative in thought. Though he had years of experience, he was overshadowed by the gifted orator Everett. Their platform, a solid stand behind the Constitution, the Union, and its laws. Safe, solid, but given the troubled times, the party's platform seemed insanely naive. Their planks better suited for an election in 1824 rather than 1860. But they were not the only ones with unsettled issues. As the Democrats returned to their homes after the debacle in Charleston, they came home to a citizenry that included unionists. Remember, many from the Gulf states felt they had been hoodooed in their state's election process for delegates to attend the first convention, and many worried the same thing was about to reoccur for the second. One moderate, Georgia's Alexander Stevens, was asked, What do you think of matters now? He answered, 
why, that men will be cutting one another's throats in a little while. In less than 12 months, we shall be in a war, and that the bloodiest in history. He urged Southern Democratic extremists to drop their slave code plank when the party reconvened in Baltimore. He urged unity. Yet, as he soon learned, that seemed impossible, for Northern Democrats were still angry over what they had felt had been party treason, and Southern fire eaters were equally angry over what they perceived as threats to their region's security. Indeed, Stevens spoke for quite a few who wanted Democrats to return to Baltimore and select a compromise candidate. Yet, as the time neared, there were unsettling questions. Would the people of the Deep South want to be represented yet again by the bolters, those that had walked out? Would new state elections return the same delegates? Eight slave states had walked out in Charleston. Seven slave states stayed put. The majority of common folk and those that remained, and a significant number in those that left, wanted healing. As it turned out, seven of the eight states that walked out returned the very same delegates to Baltimore. South Carolina did not, but sent its delegates to Richmond, where an all-Southern convention was planned. Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, Georgia, and Florida sent delegates to both Richmond and Baltimore. Douglas men in no way wanted the bolters back. In their minds, those delegates walked out and should not be receded. New delegates should replace them. So, swimming in all this turmoil, the Democrats tried again. It was June 18th, a Monday, and the party convened at the Front Street Theater in Baltimore. Again, Caleb Cushing was selected chairman. As soon as the convention opened, a resolution was introduced to reseat all the delegates from Charleston, which was met with a mixture of hisses and cheers. It was an ominous start. Three hours later, and with no decision made, the first session adjourned at 5 p.m., Meanwhile, Northeastern Democrats pushed a compromise slate of candidates. Moderates Horatio Seymour of New York and Georgia's Alexander Stevens, but it was not well received. The Second Democratic National Convention had begun badly, and it got worse the next day. With each session, angry exchanges were the norm. On Thursday, the 21st, the Credentials Committee decided to exclude those from Louisiana and Alabama that bolted in Charleston. Georgia's delegates were divided evenly between those that walked out and those that were new. Arkansas would have a few new delegates, and the original delegates from Texas and Mississippi would be eligible. About this time, a letter arrived from Stephen A. Douglas pleading for unity. And if his candidacy created division, he asked that Alexander Stevens be nominated. But it was too late. The bitterness ran too deep. So deep that during the session, a delegate from Virginia monotonously began chanting, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President. He continued until finally recognized When given the floor, he, in measured words, announced that most of his delegation would leave. What followed? A silence that roared. Then 16 of 20 North Carolinians announced they would follow. Tennessee announced it would retire to caucus, but hinted it would probably not return. California and Oregon left. Kentucky and Missouri wanted time to caucus. 16 of 22 from Massachusetts left the floor to consult. The party that returned to Baltimore to hopefully find middle ground failed miserably. Anticlimactically, on June the 23rd, with many absent, Douglas and Herschel V. Johnson were nominated by a party that had no semblance of unity. 
Meanwhile, those that bolted or were denied seats met at noon on the same day that Douglas was nominated. 231 delegates from 19 states gathered at the Maryland Institute, where Alabama fire eater Yancey prevailed. A protective slave code was adopted, and on the very first ballot, a very reluctant John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky and Oregon's Joseph Lane were nominated. Breckinridge, the current vice president and president of the Senate, was not yet 40 years of age, but was well known. His grandfather had been attorney general under Jefferson. He stood over six feet tall, and though impressive in his carriage, lacked originality in thought. However, with his and Lane's nomination, the slates were now complete. For the Republicans, Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin from Maine. For the Northern Democrats, Stephen A. Douglas and his running mate, Herschel V. Johnson of Georgia. For the Southern Democrats, John C. Breckinridge and Joseph Lane of Oregon. And the Constitutional Unionist, John Bell and Edward Everett. With 303 electoral votes, 152 were required for election. For an election and vote that, like the nation, would be divided. In the American South, the two-horse presidential race would be between, essentially, Bell and Breckinridge, and in the North, between Douglas and Lincoln. As the campaign began, Lincoln's Springfield, Illinois, was inundated. He was hailed as the common man, the rail splitter, the self-made man. Unlike the others, Lincoln made no speeches, but in doing so, his silence encouraged attacks which targeted him as an enemy of the South. No matter, he refused to answer any letters from strangers on political matters. He, like most in the North, did not grasp the depth of Southern fears, their threats of secession. He, like most, thought those threats were merely cries of wolf. And so he spent the summer of 1860 holed up in the governor's room at the Illinois State House. There, he consistently refused to make any concession. Particularly, he stood by the plank that slavery could remain where it existed, but would not be allowed to expand. His party ran a well-oiled machine, so efficient that Southerners were frightened. Many believed if Lincoln won, it would only be a matter of time before slavery was not only restricted, but abolished. And indeed, there was some truth to that. In the Constitutional Union camp, Bell and Everett, were lone cries from the political wilderness. Their party generated little enthusiasm. Now, in truth, most were certain they could not win, but their mission was to carry or weaken Lincoln in the lower tier of northern states, thus deny him an electoral majority. To aid in that pursuit, the Constitutional Unionists tried fusion politics, for example, in New Jersey, there was a fusion of Breckinridge, Bell, and Douglas supporters. And in New York, constitutional unionists fused with Douglas. Each combination hoped to nix Lincoln's election. Their strength was in the border states, with those who saw themselves caught politically and quite possibly militarily in the middle. In the end... A vote for the Bell-Everett ticket was a vote against disunion. The Southern Democrats had their own dilemma, for Breckinridge was not closely identified with Southern slave code extremists. Sadly, he realized he ran on a platform committed to breaking up the Union. Astutely, Stephen A. Douglas observed that not all of Breckinridge's followers were secessionists, but every secessionist was a Breckinridge man. Like the Republicans, Southern Democrats would not concede on platform issues. They hoped to carry all the slave states, win California and Oregon, and if so, Breckinridge would have 127 of 152 electoral votes, needing only 25 from free states. 
one Southerner, the Senator from Mississippi, Jefferson Davis, also, like the Constitutional Unionists, supported fusion politics. Perhaps New York's Horatio Seymour, a man devoted to the Union and relatively free from political baggage, might be named and supported by a fusion party. Again, the fervent hope of fusion politics block a Lincoln victory. Davis actually approached Bell, Breckinridge, and Douglas with the idea. Bell and Breckinridge agreed. Douglas refused. He refused to be a party to Southern extremism. By late summer, the question was more about not who would win, but what would be the consequences, and they were dire. Of the four presidential candidates, only one defied tradition and canvassed the country. It was Douglas, who knew he could not win, but wanted to rally all good union men. And so, mustering all his steam engine-like energy, he campaigned as we today might understand. He spoke at his birthplace, Brandon, Vermont, and Concord. Boston, Portland, Providence, and other northeastern cities and sites. Believing Lincoln would win, he knew it would push the Deep South to secession, and that drove him to visit border states like Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. In Norfolk, Virginia, on August the 25th, on the steps of City Hall, with 7,000 in attendance, he, after an impassioned address, was asked, should the South be justified in secession if Lincoln was elected? To that he answered, no. To a second question, if the South secedes, would he advise Union resistance? To that an emphatic yes. That response brought a southern storm of protest down upon his head. In Raleigh, North Carolina, a few days later, Douglas was even more emphatic. I would hang every man higher than Haman who would attempt to resist by force the execution of any provision of the Constitution which our fathers made and bequeathed to us. In Baltimore, he accused Alabama's Yancey and South Carolina's Robert Barnwell Rett of conspiracy to split the nation. He said, I am burying Southern disunionism and Northern abolitionism in the same grave. And he went on, I wish to God we had an old hickory now, alive in order that he might hang northern and southern traitors with the same gallows. In Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Douglas learned that the Republicans had swept the October state elections in swing state Pennsylvania. He turned to his secretary and said, Mr. Lincoln will be the next president. We must try to save the Union. I will go south. This time, he meant the Deep South. The travel and pace wore him out. Southern extremists condemned him savagely. Ruffians made personal threats. Yet he still heard ovations in Memphis, Jackson, Tennessee, Nashville, and Chattanooga. Even found friendly faces in Georgia and Alabama. He addressed crowds in Atlanta and Macon. In Montgomery, Alabama, protesters tried to pelt him with fruit and eggs. Ever the political warrior, he still made a lengthy address from the steps of the state capitol. Meanwhile, the Republicans felt they were destiny's child. They hammered at eight years of democratic corruption and pushed for issues that demanded attention. Though, with ranks filled with progressive minds and youthful reformers across the North, there were chinks in their armor. Their moderate majority tried to distance themselves from abolitionists, and the party stressed certain platform planks dependent on where they were campaigning. In other words, in the Northwest, homesteading was the focus. In Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the Northeast, a protective tariff a Pacific Railroad in the Mississippi Valley, and internal improvements everywhere. And the party understood spectacle. Songs, emblems, salutes were developed, and Lincoln's wide awakes were remarkable. One of their marches never forgotten. 
It was held in New York City, right down Broadway. 90,000 strong, well-trained crusaders, if you will, with rockets, Roman candles, and fireworks. And as one, they sang, ain't you glad you joined the Republicans? The parade was advertised as the banners of light, and it was stunning in its showmanship and impact. In the South, where paranoia reigned, this created sheer fear and defensive solidarity. So much so that in some areas, Minutemen were organized and militia armed. And with every northern state election in September and October, southern fears increased, for Republican gubernatorial candidates were victorious in Maine, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and Indiana. Republican wins in swing states, Pennsylvania, and Indiana pushed quite a few Southerners from the Bell Camp to Breckenridge. Finally, finally it came. Election Day. It was November the 6th, 1860. A day remarkably remembered for there was no reported violence at the polls. Lincoln spent the day in the governor's room in the state capitol in Springfield. Around mid-afternoon, he left to go vote himself. At the polling site, he took a Republican ballot, modestly cut his own name from it, voted for others, then deposited his ballot. It took about five minutes. By early evening, the news was reassuring from the Northwest, but what about the East? Just before 10, a telegram came in from Simon Cameron. It read, Pennsylvania, 70,000 for you. New York, safe. Glory enough. It was welcome news, but not official. Around midnight, just as he was seated at a ball where the ladies of Springfield had prepared a supper, a messenger exploded into the room. He announced the fusion ticket in New York City had received only 27,000 votes. It appeared New York State would go Lincoln. Shouts of, you're elected, shook the rafters. In the early hours of Wednesday the 7th, it was official. The mighty electoral plum of the state of New York had fallen into Lincoln's basket. Once again, the room exploded with celebration. Lincoln said good night and went home, the 16th president of the United States. Indeed, he had won 18 of 33 states and amassed 180 electoral votes, a majority of 57. Breckenridge carried 11 states, all slave, and received 72 electoral votes. John Bell carried the border states of Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky and collected 39. Douglas, after all his effort, won only Missouri and collected only 12 electoral votes, nine from Missouri, and after splitting its vote, three from New Jersey. In the popular mandate, Lincoln won with 1,866,000 452 votes and would be a minority president. Only 39.82% of the popular vote. The second lowest share of the popular vote for a winning candidate in the history of all presidential elections in the United States. Two statistical anomalies. Bell, Breckinridge, and Douglas's combined electoral vote totaled only 123 not enough to deny Lincoln's win. And if the three's popular vote were combined, Lincoln would still have collected 169 electoral votes, again, enough to elect him. Amazing for one whose name did not appear on a ballot in 10 states, all in the South, and therefore did not receive a single vote in one-third of the states currently in the Union. That election night, the man who worked the hardest, not only for his own candidacy, but for preserving the Union, was down in Mobile, Alabama. He spent election day quietly. After dinner, he sat in the office of the Mobile Register, watching, 
and listening to the staccato telegraph dot and dash results. From the north and east, his fears became reality. He was beaten, and beaten badly. The southern extremists got what they wanted, cause for secession. As Douglas shuffled back to his quarters at ironically named the Battle Hotel, his secretary found him more hopeless than I had ever before seen him. A turbulent decade in which he, for far too long, had been in the eye of the storm, had taken its toll. His union shattered. The little giant had only seven months to live. Dead, June the 3rd, 1861, at the age of only 48. For Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party, the 4,680,529 total votes cast an 81.2% voter turnout making the election of 1860 the greatest at that time and still the second most in history. 69% of the total votes used their ballot to say that slavery should be restricted by Congress or possibly by local means through popular sovereignty. His election forced what had been building for over two and a half centuries and was clearly and cleanly expressed by the Richmond Examiner when it wrote, A party founded on the single sentiment of hatred of African slavery is now the controlling power. Six weeks later, South Carolina made good its threat. On the 20th of December, 1860, it seceded. By the time Abraham Lincoln took office, six more had followed. Indeed, on the day Lincoln was elected, to those with eyes and ears attuned to the immediate future, there were distant sounds of drums and bugles. Abraham Lincoln was to be the 16th president of a disunited union. Chief executive at a time when a slow-burning fuse first lit back in August of 1619 when the ship, the White Lion, brought 20 African slaves ashore to Jamestown, Virginia. Finally, touched off the fuse, touching off a black powder charge that had been building for 241 years and would result in four horrific years of civil war. And today, leaving us with similar issues that continue to simmer, continue to polarize, and like that great and horrible conflict, continue to bleed. For our next episode, a topic that dovetails with Abraham Lincoln's election. We head to South Carolina to Columbia and Charleston, where threat became reality. I hope you'll join us when we tell the story of the escalating drama that climaxed Thursday, December the 20th, 1860, when the Palmetto State seceded from the Union. This is Fred Kiger. I hope you'll continue to be safe and responsible. Thank you for listening. <laughs>